Hello everyone, my name is Michael Yamana. Back again today with another video for you guys. Today we're going to talk about the CRRT. Uh, we're going to talk about what CRRT is, uh, CRRT use and function, and we're going to see how the CRRT machine works. We're going to talk about, um, we're going to touch a little bit about the function of the kidney as well. And we're going to look into fluid and solvent transport system because I do think this last two are going to be super important uh, in understanding CRRT. Now, by all means, I'm not going to talk about everything uh, uh, you need to know about CRRT in this video, but I will talk about the basics of what you need to know in working with a CRRT machine. So before we go any further, I'm going to talk about a little bit about uh, the kidney and its function uh, because the whole point of the CRRT is uh, replacing the function of our kidneys, okay? CRRT, as it stands for, is a continuous renal replacement therapy, okay? So it's basically replacing the function of our kidneys uh, in case... Uh, our kidneys do not function as they should because of many reasons. So looking at the kidney, uh, just to kind of brush up on uh, our uh, anatomy um, uh, topic, um, the kidney, looking at the cross-sectional view, is made up of cortex, which is outside layer, and then medulla, which is the uh, inner layer, okay? Now, inside the medulla is where you'll find millions of nephrons, okay? So, these nephrons are the functional units of the kidney, okay? So, that's where the most important function of the kidney takes place. Now, the function of the kidney is mainly can be summarized in three. That is fluid regulation, um, cleaning of our blood, and maintaining our blood pressure, okay? Um, the way it does this is uh, we have this afferent arteriole where the kidney gets its blood supply or the blood supply uh, passes through the uh, nephron. So this image here is the nephron uh, and parts of the nephron. So this afferent arteriole kind of folds upon itself and forms glomerulus. Okay, As the blood passes through the glomerulus, it creates high pressure because it's coming from a wider affluent uh, artery to a smaller um, efferent arteriole, okay? So whenever you have fluid going from a bigger um, tube towards a smaller tube, it, you're generating a high pressure. Now, the reason this pressure is important is it will enable us to transport fluid and electrolytes across a semi-permeable membrane into the Bowman's capsule, okay? Now, when the fluid goes uh, through the Bowman's capsule and through the proximal uh, tubule is where more reabsorption of water and electrolytes take place. So more water will be reabsorbed that are lost. Uh, some important electrolytes such as calcium, sodium, and potassium will get reabsorbed in the proximal tubule and down it will go uh, through the loop of handle and all the way out through the distal covulated tubule which uh, most of our kidneys blood uh, pressure um, uh, management works okay so this is a general function of the kidney um, uh, in this video it, i'm more going to be talking about fluid regulation and cleaning of uh, blood because that's what the crrt machine uh, does uh, also important is to understand the fluid movements uh, in our body uh, now we do have three two types of fluid in our system right we have fluid that is inside of our cells, and then we have fluids that are outside of our cells. So the fluid inside of our cell, we call it intracellular fluid, okay? Intra mean inside. So uh, that accounts to 40% of our body weight, and the extracellular fluid, which is outside of our cells, uh, counts about 20% of our body weight. That is a pretty significant portion uh, that uh, uh, the fluid accounts for. So the, looking at the extracellular fluid, again, you have two forms of it. You have the fluid that is inside of your veins 
and you have the, some of the fluids that are outside of your veins. Okay, so the fluid that is outside of your veins we call the interstitial fluid. Okay, the fluid inside of your veins is going to be uh, your plasma. Now, this is uh, what we are going to be discussing about mostly is uh, extracellular fluid because that's what the uh, kidney or, or, and the uh, uh, CRRT machine manages. Not, the, not so much the, uh, the fluid inside of your cells because the idea is if the fluid outside of your cell is properly managed uh, through a fluid movement, across the semi-permeable membrane, the fluid inside of your cell will also be uh, properly managed. So that's where the CRRT machine uh, comes in place. Uh, now the fluid uh, transport system across this membrane could be uh, through a passive transport, okay, such as diffusion when uh, solutes move from a higher concentrated area uh, into a lower concentrated area. And it could be through active transport by the means of ATP or energy, right? Um, uh, one other thing also you have to keep in mind is we're, we're going to talk about ultrafiltration. Ultrafiltration uh, is mostly the transport of fluid across a semi-permeable membrane uh, by means of pressure, okay? Uh, that's one of the means uh, uh, of um, how the CRRT uh, transport fluids, okay? Um, the other three are mostly how solutes are transported and then diffusion we talked about, um, transport of solutes from higher concentration to a lower concentration. Uh, convention, or we call it solvent drag, is um, it's almost like a hemofiltration or takes uh, into account the hemofiltration and that's when fluid uh, gets transported, it drags with it the solutes, okay? Adsorption is all the molecules that end up getting attached on the semi permeable membrane. Um, so keep this, keep this uh, points in mind as we move forward in this lecture. So let's talk about renal replacement therapy. Um, it's pretty easy because the, just as the name implies, what renal replacement therapy is, is replacing the function of the kidneys. Now, the reason we are replacing the function of the kidneys is because we do not have a properly functioning kidneys because of so many different reasons, okay? It could be from a kidney disease uh, or, uh, or many other disease. Uh, at some point, the kidney uh, will, uh, um, will not function as it is supposed to, and that's when we uh, need to replace it with an outside external machine. So it could be uh, intermittent, uh, this renal replacement therapy, or it could be continuous. So when it's continuous, now it becomes a CRRT, right? Continuous Renal Replacement Therapy. And that's the focus of this video. Now, just, in, just to let you know, you guys, the uh, intermittent RRT is um, hemodialysis. That's one of them. And then if you ever heard of the SLID or sustained low efficiency daily dialysis. So intermittent hemodialysis, it's a more aggressive way of pulling fluids from a patient. Uh, and it usually is done within uh, three to four hours, usually two to four hours. Um, and within those short period of hours, you get to pull up to three, four uh, liters outside, uh, out of the patient. Now that is a pretty, uh, um, a pretty aggressive way of treating, uh, 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 of treating a fluid imbalance or electrolyte imbalance. But for most of us, for, for me and for you who's watching this video, that is possible. Uh, most of the hemodialysis patients are able to tolerate that kind of therapy. However, 
uh, patients that are critically ill, uh, say inside of the intensive care unit, are not going to be able to tolerate such kind of aggressive treatment, which is why uh, the use of a continuous renal replacement therapy on a course of a 24 hours or more is necessary. So within the continuous renal replacement therapy, and then we have four of them. Uh, in this video, we're going to talk about the CVV HDF, or it stands for continuous venovenous hemodiafiltration, because it covers all the other uh, three uh, above it. So um, that's uh, the basic of the basics of continuous renal replacement therapy is being able to pull out uh, and replace uh, the a patient's fluid in a longer period of time uh, very uh, slowly. Uh, unlike hemodialysis or even the slate or sustained low efficiency daily dialysis also takes um, uh, fluids out of the patient slower than hemodialysis but it is also done within uh, eight hours. So that still is too much for a patient who is uh, critically ill. So uh, uh, what is the use of CRRT we just discussed? That is to replace uh, the function of the kidneys uh, in, uh, in a situation where the kidney is damaged, just like well, what you see here in the picture. Now we have uh, acute kidney injury and we have chronic kidney injury. Um, just know that uh, with the research that has been uh, done recently, 50% uh, of all patients that are in the intensive care unit actually get uh, uh, acute kidney injury. Okay, that is a pretty uh, high number. Uh, that's pretty much half of all the patients that are in the intensive care unit. Now you're saying, you, you might be asking yourself, how come uh, half the patients uh, ICU are getting um, ac acute kidney injury while they're in the ICU? Well, the thing is because of three reasons. One, as long as the body is concerned, your kidneys are non-essential, okay? So in, in the times of great sickness, um, your body will shunt all the blood towards the two essential organs, and those are the brain and the heart. All else is considered non-essential. Uh, on top of that, uh, the kidneys need up to 20% of your cardiac output, okay? 20% is a, a, a huge demand uh, for blood. Uh, now, cutting that supply even a little bit uh, is going to have a pretty devastating effect on your kidneys, which is why you get the acute kidney injury uh, inside the SU. A third reason is rhabdomyolysis. What rhabdomyolysis is a breakdown of your muscles uh, over time when you're not using them. So our, our body, the way the human body evolved is our muscles is uh, like, you, if you don't use it, you lose it uh, kind of situation. So um, not using your muscles when you're sick and lying in bed for a while, it, it, you tend to break down your muscles. Now, this breakdown of muscles, all this extra waste has to go somewhere and that all that waste is getting uh, filtered by the kidneys and that tends to damage the kidneys as well. So these are your uh, three top reasons uh, why patients in the uh, critical care units uh, end up getting uh, acute kidney injury. Uh, also know that uh, critical um, CRRT is only meant for patients that are over 20 kilograms or roughly 40 pounds of body weight. Now in this machine, we're going to talk about uh, Prismaflex. That is the machine that is mostly used to carry out the CRRT. Uh, Prismaflex does for us a lot of things. It loads and primes. Uh, the, uh, the pump, so with, with blood. Uh, it pumps the blood to and from the patient. Uh, it delivers anticoagulant solutions while the blood is running through the machine. The need for this anticoagulant is so we do not have any clots in our system because every time you're moving the blood outside of the body, there is a high risk of getting a blood clot. So this Prismaflex device allows us to inject or insert anticoagulant solutions uh, inside of the blood when it is outside of the body. 
it monitors the system and alerts so if there's uh, any things that is out of the ordinary if there's any kinks or anything like that the prism of lakes have a good alert system that will uh, let us know of these things uh, it controls fluid removal rate um, so it saves you a lot of times where you do not have to add and subtract the fluid that's going in and out as a patient the prismaflex device does a pretty good job in doing those automatically for you the other is air management now you do not want to eject any air into the patient now when the blood is going through the tube there's a good chance some air might sneak into it so the PrismaFlex uh, device has a pretty good uh, um, system where it detects this extra air uh, and we'll talk about it more uh, later on in this video but it will allow us to excrete that extra air before it gets to the patient. So when do we use uh, CRRT uh, just like we talked about during kidney injury? But the question now is how do we know uh, our kidney is injured? How do we know uh, a patient is going through uh, an acute uh, kidney injury? Well, the first and most important thing is decreased urine output. Uh, anytime you have uh, um, a any form of kidney injuries, a decreased urine output is going to be your primary uh, and a very important uh, um, um, alert that you um, are going to know it's a good it's, it's a good way which is why in, in a lot of hospital uh, urine is constantly measured uh, by the hour uh, because uh, any drop of, out of the usual or out of the norm is a good indication that your kidneys are not properly functioning now uh, a normal output a normal urine output is half a meal per kilogram per hour okay so uh, a guy which is 100 kilos, let's say, uh, will have uh, 50 mils of urine uh, out every hour. If it gets to 25 mils per hour, 15 mils per hour, then that should concern you. On top of that, we look at their lab works. So we look at the creatinine, right? So what creatinine is a, is a breakdown of creatinine, which we get from either a muscle breakdown or from a breakdown of the protein that we consume. And our normal level is between 0.5 to 1.5. Uh, now it, it is normal uh, for men uh, or someone who has just consumed uh, a high protein diet uh, or who, someone who is just, who, who works regularly, uh, uh, who works out regularly at the gym. It is normal for those people to have higher than normal creatinine, okay? which is why we also look at the blood urea nitrogen so what the bun means or blood urea nitrogen is how much nitro urea nitrogen we have in our blood so how why that is important is our liver tends to break down ammonia which is a waste product into urea and nitrogen so that urea and nitrogen is normally supposed to be excreted out of our body uh, by means of kidney now if your kidney is not properly functioning um, we are going to be retaining all that extra urea and nitrogen which gives us higher than normal uh, uh, BUN levels in our uh, in our bloodstream uh, just to let you know our normal BUN level is 7 to 20 milligram per deciliters uh, so anything that is higher than that in combination with a uh, higher creatinine in combination with a decreased urine output should give you a good idea uh, that you're having some form of a kidney injury. Uh, also, uh, additionally, you may look at the glomerular filtration rate, uh, which will drop down below 60 in case of any kidney injury. So we need to have an access to our body in order to run this CRRT, right? We need to have some form of vascular catheter that needs to get inserted into our vein to take blood from the body and insert the purified uh, blood back to the patient. Uh, this vascular catheter is usually inserted in the right intrajugular vein. Nine times out of 10, you will see it 
inside of the right intrajugular vein and the tip will rest right above the atrium of the heart. All right, let's take a look at some of the pumps that we have on the CRRT machine. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll start looking, by, looking at the blood pump, uh, which is this big circle here you see in the middle of the CRRT machine. And what the blood pump does is it takes fluid from the patient, run it through the hemofilter. This right here is a hemofilter. And we'll talk about it some more in the next slide. But it runs it through the hemofilter and gives it back to the patient. Um, next is the replacement pump. So just like the name indicates, replacement pump, we use it to replace any lost fluids back into the bloodstream uh, before it goes to the patient. Uh, your, blood, your replacement pump can be given pre or post filter. That means that can, we can give it before the blood goes into the hemofilter or we can give it after the blood comes out of the hemofilter. Now, the reason this is important is if we replace fluids before the blood gets into the hemofilter, we're going to have hemodilution, okay? Uh, the blood is going to be diluted, so therefore, once it gets into the hemofilter, it's not going to be filtered properly, okay? If we filter the blood or if we wait to uh, replace fluids, before or after uh, the blood passes through the hemofilter, then the blood that's going to be going inside the hemofilter is going to be more uh, concentrated. Therefore, it uh, tends to clot more as it goes into the hemofilter and it tends to reduce the lifespan of the hemofilter. So we have to have a good uh, balance of this pre and post uh, replacement uh, fluids and both of them are going to be necessary. Your replacement pump is going to be at the bottom right corner of your CRRT device. And then you have your diastolate pump. Your diastolate pump is going to be um, top left corner of your diastolate uh, of your CRRT device. And simply the diastolate pump is going to deliver the diastolate solution into the fluid compartment of the hemofilter. Again, we'll talk about it a little more in, in the next slide, what the uh, hemofilter is. Uh, and then looking at the blood pump, uh, I'm sorry, the pre-blood pump, uh, all that does is deliver replacement solution into the blood access line, that is, immediate, as the blood immediately comes out of the patient. The pre-blood uh, pump uh, is mostly uh, used for um, any um, anticoagulation that is going to be given as the blood runs through the device to avoid any blood clots. Okay, um, number five, we have the effluent pump, which is going to be your bottom uh, left corner here uh, of the CRRT device. And the effluent pump, uh, it automatically controls the rate for us, um, the fluid removal rate that is, and it also moves the diastolate solution. And then the syringe pump, uh, which is this syringe right here, also used to inject uh, any anticoagulation medicine as the blood runs through the device. Now, the, the bags that you see here are going to be color represented, so they're going to be easy to identify. Say, for example, the replacement pump represented by a purple dot or a, a purple uh, hexagon shape. And then your diastolate pump represented by a green square. And then you have, um, I'm sorry, diastolate bag. And then your pre blood uh, bag is going to be a white triangle. And finally, your effluent pump, your effluent uh, bag is going to be a yellow circle. So that, that will give you uh, an easy uh, way of identifying uh, what bag goes where. Um, 
So let's take a look at this uh, Hemo filter device. Uh, and it is going to be probably the most important part of the uh, filter or of the uh, CRRT machine. Uh, and what it does is it obviously filters waste, waste products by creating a semi-permeable membrane between the dacelate and the blood. So if you take the Hemo filter and look at a cross-sectional view of it, so if you cut it in half and look at it from top to bottom, this is what you're going to be looking at. You're going to be looking at this little straws, uh, or what looks like a straws, filled with blood and then surrounded with the diastolate solution. Okay, and within the permeable membrane, uh, so say within the straw, is where the exchange of uh, waste products and electrolytes takes place. Uh, by, by the same way we talked about earlier, so through dilution and uh, hemofiltration. Um, the uh, Prismaflex device for CRRT is going to come with several safety features for patient safety, obviously. Uh, so we have the alarm, uh, alarm lights, uh, usually at the very top of the device, uh, that tells us um, if we're good to go or if we are uh, having some kind of a problem. It's a good way of alerting us of what's going on in the uh, CRRT system. The display screen, obviously, uh, it's, it's a touch, touch screen and it displays what's going on. It uh, gives us several information about the patient, how much fluid we're pulling, uh, and all that is going to be displays, displayed on the display screen. Pressure monitors, we have three of them, one here, two and three over here, and uh, they are used to identify if there are any kinks in your system. Um, air bubble detector, obviously uh, super important. This is used to avoid any blood, uh, any air that's going to be uh, going inside of the blood. Um, so it detects any air that's going to go inside the blood. Uh, the return line clamp, uh, also called blood patient sensor, uh, is usually clamped right before the blood goes into the patient if there is any error that's happening before. So it's pretty much the last uh, uh, protection that the blood has uh, before it goes to uh, the patient. Okay, so the system clamp itself here, if, there, if say there is air, air in the system, uh, it's not going to be uh, going into the patient because the machine uh, tends to cla clamp itself. And then we have um, syringe pump. That's where we put our syringe, where we use, where we uh, inject um, any um, blood thinners if need be. We have a barcode, a barcode reader, which uh, enables us to decode barcode that is on the disposable set. You're not, you don't see the disposable set here, but it, it's what is added on top of it where uh, the blood tends to circulate. It's, it's uh, basically a bunch of tubes that gets put on the CRRT machine um, that includes the uh, tubes, the, the pathway of the blood. Uh, we have the blood leak detector, uh, just like the name implies, it detects any leak uh, there is in the system. So it, it tends to recognize any red blood cells and uh, will let you know if you have um, leak in your system. Uh, lastly, you have the scales at the very bottom and that's where we hang the bags we talked about in the previous uh, uh, slide and this scale is super important because it gives us an accurate measurement of how much fluid the patient's getting and how much fluid we're pulling out of the patient. All right, let's take a look at some of the solutions we use in the CRRT machine. Um, so we have the dacelate solution, we talked about that. So the dacelate solution contains the electrolytes, the buffers, and it, uh, by the end, our goal, by the end of the CRRT, our goal is to match the plasma levels of the diastolate solution, okay? And then we have the replacement solution. Again, we talked about this. This, this is a solution that gets infused before and after uh, the blood passes through the filter. 
um, and it's, it goes directly into the blood and is removed uh, and wholly removed uh, at the end by the effluent pump. Um, and lastly is anticoagulation. Again, that's simply uh, injected or added into the CRT system to avoid any blood clots. And here we'll uh, look at uh, anticoagulation in more detail. Um, more specifically, citrate is what we use mostly uh, to avoid any blood clots. Now, the way citrate works is it binds with uh, calcium to create calcium citrate, thereby uh, depriving the blood of calcium. Now, why calcium is super important in our blood coagulation system is it tends to build factors or it changes, uh, it, it turns factors into clotting material. So all the fibrinogens and whatnot that's produced by your liver, uh, it, it's calcium makes them uh, a usable material. So without calcium, we're not going to have a proper, uh, a proper coagulation. So which is good, that's what we want. Uh, we want the blood to be thin. We don't want the blood to build any clots. The problem is when we do that, uh, we also have to keep in mind not to pull so much calcium out of the patient because uh, hypocalcemia, uh, especially severe hypocalcemia, is going to have a more detrimental uh, uh, effect on your patient, which is why um, calcium is infused separately through an IV uh, on your patient as you're giving the citrate solution. So your citrate solution is going to be uh, put right at the patient as the blood moves out of the patient. Okay, so it's going to be on your pre-blood pump. So we talked about it. So the pre-blood pump pumps the blood uh, uh, when the when the patient when we draw the, that first initial blood out of the patient before it goes anywhere uh, is when your uh, pre-blood uh, pre pumps uh, place into action and whatever solution you have in your pre-blood pump gets injected into that blood. So now this happens before the blood gets into the filter. Okay, so once the blood gets into the filter, this extra uh, calcium citrate, so the citrate that's binded with the calcium, gets excreted out uh, by the effluent pump and gets uh, put or dis gets disposed of get disposed of in your um, effluent bag, okay, which are, which is at the very left corner of your um, CRRT device. Okay, so whatever is left that is being returned to the patient is going to lack in calcium, okay, or free uh, ionized calcium or free calcium ions. Now your normal ionized calcium is supposed to be between 0.9 and 1.3 uh, mag per deciliters. This is more a conservative and more con more uh, strict number. Other books might tell you between uh, 0.8 up to uh, 1.5. Uh, it's different, but, but generally we want our ionized calcium to be between 0.9 to 1.3 milligrams per uh, deciliters. Um, the problem is uh, we, your ionized or your free calcium is not going to be sufficient as the blood is returned to the patient. Okay, so this is why it is very important that you uh, infuse calcium drip through a, a separate uh, IV um, to the patient as the patient is on a citrate solution. Now, the moment you take off the citrate solution, you should also cut off your calcium infusion. Otherwise, now you're uh, putting the patient at risk of hypercalcemia, okay? So that's the basics of the anticoagulation anti that takes place um, in your CRRT, uh, if you're using uh, citrate, that is. Uh, so last but not least, we will take a look at alarms and alerts. Again, uh, looking at the safety uh, devices, your, we talked about the alarm being at the very top of your um, uh, Prismaflex device, CRRT device. Uh, so what the, the, this alarm uh, is going to have different noises and different colors. So here in the slide, we we'll talk about what these different alarms mean, okay, what this different 
uh, colors indicate. So if you see a green light at the very top of your Prismaflex device, it means all good, everything is working fine, uh, and keep doing what you are doing. Now, if you're looking at a constant yellow light at the very top of your machine, that is just an FYI. That's just uh, the machine giving you information, okay? Uh, nothing you need to take action on. Now, if that yellow light is flashing, it's different. That is more of a caution alarm, not urgent, but you'll definitely need to investigate and take action. And obviously, if you have a red flashing light, uh, that's a warning and it's uh, usually something pretty serious and you need to attend to it uh, uh, as fast as possible. So this is a more of a general uh, need to know uh, before you run a CRRT device. Uh, like I said, it's not everything. Uh, I will be making another video on this topic eventually. Uh, but go ahead, subscribe to my channel if you are interested in this topics. And I'll be putting some more videos in the future. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.